Chapter 29 Spears shook his head as he raised from his squat next to the drive housing. There weren't any bombs connected to the gyro switch complex, nor had there been any in the other locations. The son of a bitch had bluffed him. He felt a moment of irritation, an urge to wrap his hands around the man's throat and throttle him. But it passed. It didn't matter. So one marine and one civilian had saved their skins by lying to him. So what? After he demonstrated how he would liberate Earth, who would believe such a story? Assuming that tricky bastard sergeant and his woman were foolish enough to try to spread it around. The guy was a career marine. He knew what pissing off a general was worth in the long run. No. Chances were they'd dig in somewhere and pretend to be invisible. If they kept quiet, there was a chance he wouldn't find them later. If they shot their mouths off, they'd have to leave a trail. No, it wasn't going to happen. Of course, there might be bombs hidden somewhere here on the MacArthur, but Spears didn't believe it for a second. No, he'd been foxed. Once more, he offered a two-fingered salute to Wilkes. Good marine, that one. Did we make it? In the tiny cabin of the pod, Wilkes blew out a big breath. <sighs> yeah, we did. He's outside our radar range, but he must have gone back to the cargo ship to check it out. <laughs> I'd love to see his face when he realises there weren't any explosives rigged. I'll pass on seeing his face again, thank you. Wilkes laughed, then frowned. He got away though. He beat us and he got away. I just wanted to get him in my sights. You ought to be glad he didn't get us in his sights. Where are we by the way? And where are we going? We'll be inside Luna's orbit in another couple of days, if the guidance computer on this piece of junk can be trusted. I'm getting some signals from the region, too faint to hear much. Could be automatic from Earth, or something from the colony on the moon, if it's still there. Gateway station in L5 orbit, maybe. I've got the scanner set to pick up the strongest input and home in on it. You can shuck the suit if you want. There's a chemical toilet in the back, behind the blue partition. We'll have to sleep in our seats, and our diet will be a bit limited. But we should make it okay. You did real good back there, Wilkes. You're a lot smarter than you let on. You think so? Yeah, and a whole lot smarter than you look. She smiled, and he returned it. He fucking hated losing spears, but she was right. It was better to be alive to fight another day, and at least they had that much. Spears brought the queen out of deep sleep first, still securely in her cage, of course. She could see him through the clear walls, and he flicked the cigar lighter over and over, watching the little flame reflect off the heavy clear steel plastic. Oh yes, I know you remember me. The time has come for your children to go forth and do battle. You can lay a million eggs if you do as you're told. If my soldiers obey me as they should. Do you understand? He put his hand on the plastic. The queen turned her head slightly, but did not move. She understood. He was sure of it. Not the words, maybe. But she was smart enough. He knew that. The drones weren't too swift. Their wattage was real dim. But the queen wasn't stupid. She knew him and she remembered him, and he was certain he'd put the fear of God in the form of spears into her. It would all go the way it was supposed to go, and soon the moment would be upon them. Approaching vessel, identify yourself. The call came. This is Gateway Station calling. Wilkes smiled at Billy. <laughs> This is the escape pod from the Colonial Marine vessel Jackson, he said. Two passengers on board, uncontaminated, repeat, no alien contamination on this ship. 
Escape Pod Jackson. Open your control modem for Greed Computer Override. They were still far enough away so the transmission turnaround time took a few seconds. Wilkes gave control of the pod's engines to the grid computer. Pod Jackson, you are in the grid. We'll fly you in Lazy 8s until the decontamination team can rendezvous your vessel. Estimate arrival time... 9 hours. <laughs> Copy Gateway. We'll be there. Billy lifted an eyebrow. They have to check us out to make sure we aren't carrying any little toothy surprises, he said. That means the station is clean. Gateway is pretty big, half the size of the old Lunar One colony. 12, 15,000 people before the trouble on Earth. Probably built a few more modules since then to make room for escapees. We'll be quarantined until they are damn sure we're not infected. That'd be my guess. Run us through a cat scanner or a floor proj and then we're home free. <laughs> I can't believe it, she said. We're finally going to get somewhere safe. Maybe, he thought. But looking at her face, he didn't say it. He only nodded. It would take most of his remaining fuel to land the carrier, but he had the APC for his own return to orbit. The reason he had brought the MacArthur was that it could stand a dunking in atmosphere and normal gravity. He expected to take heavy casualties, despite the training and arms his men had, but that was to be expected, and the ship would have to stay behind. It was unimportant. As the ship spiralled down towards its landing in South Africa, Spears showered, shaved, and put on his dress blacks. He strapped the revolvers on, the sword in its sheath, his boots looked at himself on the monitor. Sharp. The way a commanding general should look. Fit. Ready. Imperial, almost. He took one of the remaining cigars and tucked it into his belt, to open and light when the ship achieved their landing. The troops were already being decanted, although the Queen was still safely in her cage. By the time they reached the ground, they would be ready. There would certainly be a hive nearby. He had his computer searching for one, and they would put down close to it. When the wild aliens streamed out to attack the ship, they would get a big surprise. The cameras were on, the automatic director picking the most dramatic shots, according to the program, that Spears had installed. Low angles on him, mostly, with plenty of background stuff he could cut together later. Fully dressed, Spears moved to the staging area where the troops, numbers glowing dimly on their heads, stood quietly, awaiting their orders. Slime dripped from their mouths and there was a slight clatter of hard chitin when they moved or touched each other. Stand by, men, Spears said. He went to strap in for the final approach. Weather radar said there was a storm front moving across the landing area. Damn. He had hoped for a sunny afternoon. Well, the cameras could adjust for the lighting. He could clean it all up when he edited it. Besides, a little lightning and rain would only add to the drama. This was all background stuff anyway. Once they were down, he would have his computer send out a live broadcast of the battle. The fortunate watchers could say they had seen it as it actually happened. On Gateway Station, Billy and Wilkes cleaned up and went to make their report to the powers that were. A lot had happened since they'd left Earth, nearly all of it bad. So the medic leading them to the debriefing station said. Yeah, the man continued. Nobody knows how many people are still alive down levels. Those who are, are pretty tough and good at hiding. Billy thought about the little girl she'd seen on the casts back at the military base. Was she still alive? Hey Henry, check this out! The medic leading them slowed as a woman nearby waved at them. What you got, Brucey? Live cast from Earth. Look. Billy and Wilkes moved with the medic. Jesus, Billy said. 
Spears. Henry and the woman Brucey turned to look at her. You know this nut? Billy and Wilkes looked at each other. Yeah, Wilkes said. We're old friends. The ramp lowered and Spears walked out into the rain. His hat brim offered enough protection so the cigar stayed lit, though it was getting pretty damp. He sucked on it hard to keep it going. In the rainy distance, Spears saw shadowy forms approaching. He drew his sword and pointed at them. First squad, front and centre. Second squad, fan out and cover the flanks. He had decided to hold off on giving his men weapons until he saw how his close combat tactics worked. Number 15 moved closer to Spears, turned its head and looked at him. Go get them, trooper, Spears said. He waved the shining stainless steel blade. Number 15 stood motionless. Then its mouth gaped and jelly-like drool dripped from its open jaws. I gave you a direct order, Spears said. Number 15's inner jaw oozed past the outer teeth. I'll not have disobedience. Spears swung the sword. It was heavy, made of good surgical stainless, with an edge sharp enough to shave with. The blade caught the alien's thin neck. The strike was perfect, slicing between the vertebrae into the thinner and more flexible material over the spine. Number 15's head toppled off and fell. Enough acid clung to Spears' sword blade so that it immediately began to smoke. The metal dissolved and ran under the pattering of the rain. Spears stared at the ruined blade. God damn it! He dropped the sword and pulled both of his Smith & Wesson revolvers. He fired at the corpse of number 15. Holy shit, Brucey said. Wilkes and Billy stared. Wilkes looked down and realised that Billy was holding his hand. Half a dozen of the troops came out of the ship behind Spears. They were carrying the Queen in her cage. She made a gesture at one of them and it fumbled with the locking mechanism. Get away from that! Spears yelled. He emptied the remaining rounds from his revolvers at the drone. Number nine, he saw. To no effect. The soft lead bullets flattened against the recruit's armour. The cage door opened. Spears dug for his cigar lighter, held it up so the emerging queen could see it, flicked the lighter on. Despite the wind and the rain, the lighter's flames sprang up and danced in the storm. Fire, see? I'll burn every fucking egg you ever laid. Fire! Oh man, somebody said. Billy wasn't sure who. She was squeezing Wilkes' hand, hard, and he was squeezing back. The Queen paused in front of Spears, looking down from her four metre height. That's right, bitch. I'm the man with the fire. I cook the babies. Fuck with me and we'll scramble some eggs. You bet. Like dogs, the aliens could not really smile, but the queen seemed to, the way her jaws moved. She flicked out one of her smaller arms and slapped the lighter away. Fuck! Then she grabbed Spears and lifted him, using her larger arms. He struggled, cursed, pulled the cigar from his mouth and tried to poke her with the glowing end. It was all going wrong. It wasn't supposed to be like this. He was supposed to be in control. The queen reached up and caught Spears around the throat with one mighty claw. Don't do it, men! He screamed. Don't listen to her! I am your commander now! Obey me! Stop her! Stop her! Those were his last words. His last thought was that somebody had made a mistake. He had time to realise that it was him, that the Queen had merely been biding her time, and that her time was now.
With a quick move, the queen pulled Spear's head off. She did it as easily as a man might pull the head off a flower. She dropped the body into the mud below the ramp, held the head for a moment longer, then tossed it aside. As luck had it, the head hit right in front of one of the cameras and rolled to a stop facing the lens. The expression on the dead man's face was one of absolute horror. So much for the revolution, Wilkes said, staring at the picture. The onrushing alien stopped and looked at the newcomers. After a moment, the would-be attackers turned and moved off through the storm. The newly arrived queen led her children away. The glowing numbers on their heads were visible for quite a distance before they faded into the rain. Quite a distance. Fuck, Henry said. Oh, yeah.